The Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens, dramatised by Barry Campbell and Constance Cox, with Freddie Jones, Elizabeth Spriggs, Douglas Livingstone, and Simon Cadell as Charles Dickens. Part three, Alarms and Excursions. Mr. Pickwick's apartments in Goswell Street, although on a limited scale, were not only of a very neat and comfortable description, but peculiarly adapted for the residence of a man of his genius and observation. His landlady, Mrs. Bardell, the relict and sole executrix of a deceased customs house officer, was a comely woman of bustling manners and agreeable appearance, with a natural genius for cooking. The only other inmates of the house were a large man and a small boy. The first, a lodger. The second, a production of Mrs. Bardell's. Cleanliness and quiet reigned throughout the house, and in it, Mr. Pickwick's will was law. Mrs. Bardell. I nearly finished the dusting, sir, and then I'll leave you in peace. Mm. Your little boy is a long time delivering my message. Why, it's a good long way to the borough, sir. Ah, very true, so it is. Mm. Uh, Mrs. Bardell. Yes? Uh, do you think... Do you think it is a much greater expense to keep two people than to keep one? No, Mr. Pickwick, what a question. Well, but do you? Oh, that depends. That depends a good deal upon the person, you know, Mr Pickwick, and whether it's a saving and careful person, That's sir. very true. But the person I have in mind... Yes, sir. This person has a considerable knowledge of the world and a great deal of sharpness, which may be of material use to me. La, Mr Pickwick. Uh, to tell the truth, Mrs Bardell, I have made up my mind. Oh, dear me, sir. Uh, you'll think it very strange now that I never consulted you about this matter and never even mentioned it until I sent your little boy out this morning. Oh, Mr. Pickwick. Well, what do you think? Oh, Mr. Pickwick, you're very kind, sir. It'll save you a great deal of trouble, won't it? Oh, I, I never thought anything of the trouble, sir, and hmm. of course I should take more trouble to please you than ever, but <laughs> it's so kind of you, Mr. Pickwick, to have so much consideration for my loneliness. Well, to be sure, I never thought of that. Uh, when I am in town, you'll always have somebody to sit with you. I'm sure I ought to be a very happy woman, sir. And your little boy. Oh, bless his heart. He too will have a companion, a lively one, who will teach him, I'll be found, more tricks in a week than he would ever learn in a year. Oh, you dear. Uh, oh, you good, kind, uh, playful, dear old Mr. Pickwick. Let me kiss you. Yes, my so. Oh, 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 my good woman. Oh, 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 if you want to come in. Oh, let them come. I'll never leave you. Dear kind soul. But, but, but me, Mrs. Bardell, someone's coming up the stairs. No, come up the stairs, Mrs. Bardell. No, don't let's go. Bless us. Oh, you did to my mark. Oh, help. We can jump and slow down. Help. Help me. I'm taking this villain away. Oh, my shin, my leg. Oh, he's mad. Oh, what is the matter? I don't know. Take the boy away. Help me lead this woman downstairs. Oh. Oh, I'm better now. Let me uh, help you downstairs. Thank you, oh. Thank you. Uh, phew. Never in all my life. Phew. But what's been going on? I exactly. I cannot conceive. I cannot conceive what is the matter with the woman. I had merely announced to her my intention of keeping a manservant. When she fell into the extraordinary paroxysm in which you found a very extraordinary thing. Very? Very. Mm. And placed me in an extremely awkward situation. Very? Very. Mm. Yes. Yes. Uh, there's, a, there's a man waiting in the passage. He came in with, with that boy. Ah, it's the man somewhere I spoke of. I sent the boy to the borough to fetch him. Have the goodness to call him in, Snodgrass. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Have you come in? Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, come in, come in. You will remember me, I suppose. <laughs> I should think so. Mm. Queer start, that there here, but he was one too many for you, weren't he? Up to snuff and a pinch or two over, eh? Yes, yes I'll never mind that matter now. I wanted to speak to you about something else. Now, with regard to the matter on which I, with the concurrence of these gentlemen, sent to That's you... That's the are out with it, as the father said to the child when he swallowed a farthing. That's quite. We want to know, in the first place... 
whether you have any reason to be discontented with your present situation. Uh, before I answer that, gentlemen, mm. I should like to know, in the first place, whether you're going to provide me with a better. I have half made up my mind to engage room myself. Have you, though? Wages? Twelve pounds a year. Clothes? Two suits. Work? To attend on me, travel about with me and these gentlemen. Oh, Take good. the bill down. I'm let to a single gentleman and the terms agreed on. You accept the situation? Certainly. Oh, if the clothes so fits me half as well as the place, they'll do. With the single exception of one amiable indiscretion in which an assistant housemaid had equally participated, the history of Mr. Weller's conduct was so very blameless that Mr. Pickwick felt fully justified in closing the engagement that very evening. With the promptness and energy which characterise not only the public proceedings but all the private actions of this extraordinary man, he set off the very next day with his new servant to Eatonswill, where the members of the Pickwick Club were able to observe the strife and turmoil of an election. But no sooner had the buffs and the blues concluded their business than Mr Pickwick, hearing that Mr Alfred Jingle was at present residing in the good old town of Bury St Edmunds, set off once more with Sam Weller in attendance, the two of them perched on the outside of a stagecoach. There is no month in the year in which nature wears so beautiful an appearance as in the month of August, Orchards and cornfields ring with the hum of labour, trees bend beneath thick clusters of rich fruit, and the corn, waving in every light breath that sweeps above it, tinges the landscape with a golden hue. The influence of scenes like these were not lost upon the well-regulated mind of Mr Pickwick, intent though he was on exposing the real character of the nefarious jingle in whatever quarter he might be pursuing his fraudulent designs. Delightful prospect, sir. Beats the chimney pot, sir. I suppose you've hardly seen anything but chimney pots and bricks and mortar all your life, Sam. I weren't always a boat, sir. I was a wagoner's boy once. Huh? Well, when was that? When I was first pitched neck and crop into the world to play leapfrog with its trouble, sir. Uh -huh. I was a carrier's boy at starting, then a wagoner's, then a helper, then a boots. Now I'm a gentleman's servant. I shall be a gentleman myself one of these days, perhaps, with a pipe in my mouth and a summer house in the back garden. Who knows? I shouldn't be surprised for one. You're quite a philosopher, Sam. It must have been a very great service to you in the course of your rambling life. Service, sir? You may say that. Mm. After I ran away from the carrier and before I took up with the Vagina, I had unfurnished lodgings for a fortnight. Well, where were they? The dry arches of Waterloo Bridge, sir. Only if there is any objection to it, it's that the situation's rather too airy. Oh. <laughs> I see some queer sights there. I imagine you did, sir. Uh, sights, sir, as uh, penetrate your benevolent art and come out on the other side. You don't see the regular wakegrips there, they know it's better. It's the worn out, starving, houseless creatures what rolls themselves up in the dark corners of them lonesome places. Poor creatures as ain't up to the tuppany rope. Pay yeah. Sam, um, what is the tuppany rope? Just a cheap lodging house, sir, where the beds is tuppence a night. What do they call a bed a rope for? Bless your innocence, sir. That ain't it. It's like this here. When the lady and gentleman as keeps the hotel first begun business, they used to make the beds on the floor, but this wouldn't do at no price. We have not. Well, you see, sir, because instead of taking a moderate two penny for sleep, the lodgers used to lie there half a day. So now they has two ropes about six foot apart and free from the floor, which goes right down the room, and the beds are made of slips of cool sacking stretched across them. Well, well, sir, at six o'clock every morning, they let's go to rope at one end and down falls all the lodgers. Consequences being thoroughly wake, they gets up very quietly and walks away. Barry! Beg pardon, sir, is this Barry St Edmunds? What? It is! And this, I see, is the Angel Hotel. We are light here, Sam. Uh, but, 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 some caution is necessary. Order a private room, but don't... Mention my name. You understand? Ooh. Right as a trivet, sir. And Boy, first of all, ascertain the jingle Larry. is in the house. Right, sir. Ah, Sam, you've been very quick. Didn't expect to be long, sir. Dinner satisfactory? Oh, 
Excellent. Good, and mm. so's my news, sir. This here Charles Fitzmarshall, alias Alfred Jingle Esquire, has a private room here what's reserved until further notice. <gasps> then he must have some very deep laid plot in mind. <laughs> You are not able Ah, uh, not yet, sir. All I learnt was he's spending the evening in some private house in this here neighbourhood and has taken his servant with him. Pity. You might have talked to the servant. Never fear, sir. I shall talk to him in the morning. Mm. Then you can arrange what's best to be done mm. and we can act according. Will you want me any further tonight, sir? No, Sam. <laughs> Get yourself some supper and go to bed. Thank you, sir. And if I might advise, sir, you have a good night's rest and don't go worriting about this here deepen until the morning. There's nothing so refreshing as sleep, sir, <laughs> as the servant girl said before she drank the egg cup full of laudanum. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> you're right, Sam. Good night. Good night, sir. Egg cup full. Early on the ensuing morning, Mr. Weller, whose evening had not been as sedate as his master's, was dispelling the remains of the night's conviviality by a vigorous application of pump water, when he was attracted by the appearance of a young man in mulberry-coloured livery who was sitting on a bench in the yard reading what appeared to be a hymn book. Oh. You're a rum and you are. Morning, Governor. How are you? Good morning, sir. I'm pretty well, I'm thankful to say. I hope you're the same, sir. If I felt less like a walking brandy bottle, I shouldn't feel quite so staggery this morning. You stopping at the Angel? I am, sir. Then how is it you weren't one of us last night? You seem one of the jolly sort. Oh, I... Looks as convivial as a live trout in a lime basket. I was out last night with my master. Oh, what's his name when he's at home? Fitzmarshall. Mr Charles Fitzmarshall. Is that so? Give us your hand, old fella. I should like to know you. I like your appearance. How very strange. I liked yours so much I wanted to speak to you from the very first moment I saw you under the pump. Then what do you say? We seal our acquaintance with a drop of something in the tap room. Oh, that would be most agreeable, sir. What's your name, my patriarch? Job, sir. Job Trotter. Mine's Volker, and my master's name is Vilkins. Oh. Gin and water. There you are. Here. Is that your prayer book, Mr Trotter? Uh, it's a hymn book, Mr Walker. When I'm forced to witness my master's wickedness, I find it a great consolation. So it's a bad sort of place you've got there, Mr Trotter? <laughs> oh, very bad. Your health, Mr Walker. So bad, I've never known a worse one. And worse than that, my master's going to be married. Married, eh? Well, I, I don't see no harm in that, so long as he ain't doing it just for the sake of the lady's money. Is your master rich? Rich, Mr Walker. Pockets to let. Always have been. She's an immense rich heiress, and he's going to run away with her from boarding school. Some boarding school in this town, you mean? <laughs> ah, now that's a secret, Mr Walker. That's not to be told to everybody. So that's a game, is it? Well, don't you think, old fella, that if you let your master take in this here young lady, you're a precious rascal yourself? Oh, I know that, Mr Walker. And it's that that preys on my mind. But what am I to do? I won't it to the schoolmistress, of course, and give up your master. And who would believe me? The young lady would deny it, and so would my master. I should lose my place and get indicted for a conspiracy or some such thing. That's all I should get by my action. Yeah, I must admit there's something in that. Now, if I knew any respectable gentleman who would take the matter up, I might have some hope of preventing the elopement. But there's the difficulty, Mr Walker. I know no gentleman in this strange place, and ten to one if I did whether he'd believe my story. Come with me. I know just the gentleman you want. Where are we going, Mr Walker? My master's the man you need to see. He'll set you right in a twinkling. I never heard such a disgraceful story. My man did quite right to bring you to me, Mr Trotter. I am very sorry to betray my master, sir. Hmm. 
It was hard for me to do it. Uh, the feeling does you a great deal of credit, but it was your duty nevertheless. I know, sir. But it's a hard trial to betray a master, sir, whose clothes you wear and whose bread you eat, and even though he is a scoundrel, sir. a blow this here water cart business. It won't do no good, this won't. Sam. Have a little respect for this young man's feelings. His feelings? He's all very well, sir, but I think he'd do better to keep him in his bosom than let him evaporate in hot water. He's in the right, sir. I'll give way no longer. But, uh, now, where is this boarding school? Westgate House, sir. It's a large old red brick house, sir, just outside the town. And when is this villainous elopement to be carried into execution? Tonight, sir. Tonight? Bless my soul. Then instant measures must be taken. I will see the lady who keeps the establishment immediately. I, 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 I beg your pardon, sir, but that won't do. Oh, why not? My master's a very artful man, sir. He's so wound himself round this old lady's heart that you'll never believe anything to his prejudice, especially as you've no proof but the word of a servant. Oh. Nothing but taking him in the very act of eloping will convince the old lady, sir. But that would be... a. Uh... Very difficult thing to accomplish, I fear. Oh, I don't know, sir. I think it might be very easily done. How? My master and I, sir, being in the confidence of two servants, will be secreted in the kitchen at ten o'clock. When the family have retired to rest, we shall come out of the kitchen and the young lady out of her bedroom. A post-chaise will be waiting and away we go. <laughs> well? Well, sir, if you were waiting in the garden behind, alone... Why, uh, why alone? The old lady, and indeed the young one, sir, wouldn't like such a discovery to be made before more people than can possibly be helped. You're quite right. Go on. I, I am in the garden. You tap on the door, sir, at exactly half past eleven, and I let you in. You'd be in the very moment of time to assist me in frustrating the designs of this bad man by whom I have... Been unfortunately instead. Uh, blow <laughs> me if he ain't weeping again. Blessed if I don't think he's got a mane in his head as he's always turned on. Sam, hold your tongue. You're a fine young fellow, Mr. Trotter, and I admire the goodness of your heart. Take this as a mark of my esteem. No thanks, I beg of you. And remember, half past eleven. There's no fear of my forgetting it, sir. Good day to you. Oh, what a dreadful... Half past eleven. This is the time. The house is quite dark. I trust Job will be waiting behind the kitchen door. Not a sound. Perhaps that wasn't loud enough. I do hope he heard that. I don't want to wake in the whole house. Ah! Good, he's coming. Who's there? A woman. Lots of women. The whole establishment must be aroused. They're opening the door. But I must hide behind it. I dare not cross the garden or they'll see me. I'll... I'll... Who's there? What is it? No, I'm so frightened. Who is it? Cook, why don't you go a little way into the garden? Please, ma'am, oh. I don't like to. Anyway. Cook, don't answer me, if you please. I insist on your looking into the garden immediately. Oh, oh. oh it's a shame, oh. that's what it is. Oh. Mugs, take a month's notice. Oh. Cook, will you kindly obey me? Oh. Oh. Miss Smithers, what is the matter? There's a man! Oh. Oh. A man? Oh. Where? They're all in their night attire. Don't faint. Don't faint. I ain't going. I ain't going. I've got my right like everybody else. Ladies. Dear ladies. No, no. Ladies, ladies, pray hear me. I am no robber. I want the lady of the house. No. What a ferocious monster. No, no. He wants Miss Tompkins. Ring the alarm bell. No, 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 no. Please don't. Look at me. Do I look like a robber? My dear ladies, you may bind me hand and foot or lock me in a closet if you like. Only hear what I have to say. Pray hear me. 
I am Miss Tompkins, the owner ah. of this establishment. What did you want in my garden, man? I came to warn you. One of your young ladies is going to elope tonight. Elope? Yes. Who will? Your friend, Mr. Charles Fitzmarshall. My friend? I know no such person. Uh, uh, Mr. Jingle, then. I never heard the name in my life. What? Then I have been deceived and deluded. I've been the victim of a conspiracy. Dear madam, send to the angel if you don't believe me. Send for Mr. Pickwick's manservant. I implore you, ma'am. Let two of the servants repair to the angel and let the others remain here to protect us. You shall be locked meantime in the closet, sir. I am very willing to be, ma'am. Indeed, I am. For an hour and a half before the two servants came back, Mr. Pickwick sat down in the closet beneath a grove of sandwich bags and awaited the return of the messengers with all the philosophy and fortitude he could summon to his aid. Open the door, my dear madam. Oh, I give you my word, you have oh, nothing oh, to fear from this gentleman. Oh, you born babbish a tiger to him, now. Very well. Is that your order? Ah! Oh! Oh! oh sir. My dear friend! Sir, sir. Oh, my dear sir, for heaven's sake, look, uh, explain to this lady that I am neither a robber nor a man. I've told her so already. Oh. Now, now we've a chaise waiting outside to take oh. you back to the inn, Walk. and a hot supper waiting to drive oh. the cold and damp out of yours. Uh. Good night to you, ma'am. Oh. If sir. all your robbers and madmen are no more dangerous than this oh. gentleman, you can sleep soundly for many a long day. There you are, sir. Uh, Eggs, kidneys and bacon oh. and a double bumper of brandy and oh. water. That'll keep the cold out of you and put you in good heart again. Right. Oh, I'm still perplexed. Uh, Wardle, my dear friend, how was it that you came with Sam to rescue me from that dreadful plight? Sheer chance. Mm. I arrived here tonight for a few days shooting and your servant told me what had happened. Mm. We'll send for your friends to join mm. you. We'll have a jolly party on the first. Give Winkle another chance to ail, boy. <laughs> I think he's done in, sir. As soon oh. as he's fed him, Walter, oh. I'll whisk him off to bed. Oh, yes, the best thing you could do. Uh, good night, my dear fellow. See you in the morning. Mm. Whenever I meet that jingle again, wherever he is, I'll inflict personal chastisement upon him, in addition to the exposure he so richly deserves. I will, or my name is not. Uh, be quick. And whenever I catch his hold of that there melancholy chap with a black hair, if I don't bring some real water into his eyes for bunching away, my name ain't Vella. My friends, welcome. Wardle. <laughs> ah, oh, I didn't suppose you expected to find me here, eh? Oh. Tupman, how are you? Um, now, don't hang back or look sentimental, old fellow. For Rachel's sake, I wish you'd had her. For your own, I'm very glad you haven't. A young fellow like you will do better one of these days. You're very good, sir. Winkle, Snodgrass, oh, give me your hands. Oh, I've just been telling Pickwick we must have you all down for Christmas. We're going to have a wedding. A real wedding this time. Oh. A wedding? Ha <laughs> ha! Don't be alarmed, Snodgrass. It ain't Emily, only Bella and Trundle. Mm. Uh, is that all? Oh, give you joy, sir. I trust everyone is well at Dingley Dell, sir. Oh, couldn't be better. Uh, how is, uh, she, Mr. Wardle? She? Oh, you mean my single relative. Oh, she's gone away, far enough off. She couldn't bear to see the girl, so I, I let her go. Now, come along. Dinner's on the table. Oh, oh, let me down. Ah, my dear fellows. Welcome, welcome. Pray sit down, sit down. My foot. Oh, my dear old chap, what on earth's the matter? Uh, that, uh, uh, that's ruined, is my... 
I was caught in the rain while endeavouring to do a good action. Which turned out to be a piece of gammon invented by Mr Alfred Jingle Esquire, <laughs> alias Mr Charles Fitzmarshall. <sighs> you have your dinner, sir, and tell him afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I, too, I, 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 I have had something of an adventure. I've been the unconscious third party in a matrimonial dispute between Mr and Mrs Pot. <laughs> Indeed? Well, you know how Pot always asked me to take her a butt. Nothing in it, of course. But damn me if the independent didn't make an art and a verse out of it. I tore the verse out of the paper before I came away. Here, you read it, Snodgrass. It's in your line. Oh, Allow to, yes. me to see it, if you please. Oh, certainly. So you broke the lady's heart, did you, you dog? <laughs> oh, never even cracked it, so far as I know. Uh, she asked me to come back, but I'll be damned if I do. <laughs> Pot's in enough trouble as it is. She's forcing him to horsewhip the editor of the Independent. <laughs> <laughs> Silence! <laughs> you, Mr. Winkle, huh? may find this amusing. I do not. Oh, sir, I, only... I find it a wonderful and distressing circumstance that we seem destined to enter no man's house without involving him in some degree of trouble. Does it not, I ask, bespeak of indiscretion, nay, worse, the blackness of heart of my followers, that b beneath whatever roof they locate, they disturb the peace of mind and happiness of some confiding female. That's coming in uh, a bit strong. Is sir. it no not? I... Pardon, sir. The servant has just handed this here letter in. It's, it's for you, what? forwarded from London. I, I don't know this hand. Uh, Excuse me, all of you. Uh, take no notice of him, Winkle. Huh? He was hoodwinked into a nest of females, and his rheumatisms make him a bit crotchety. Mm. Spent an hour and a half in a boot cupboard. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, did I? I mentioned I was up for the shooting. Well. I can lend you a gun, Winkle, if you'd care to come along. Oh! Oh! Uh, yeah, uh, oh. Mercy on us. This can't be true. It must be just... I can't believe it. Well, What's the matter? Nobody dead, I hope. Dabman, Dabman, be so good as to read aloud. I find it impossible to believe my eyes. Um, Freeman's Court Court. Oh, I beg your pardon. Yeah. Yeah. August 28, 1830. Bardell against Pickwick. Yes. What? Yes. Sir. Having been instructed by Mrs. Martha Bardell to commence an action against you for breach of promise of marriage... Breach of promise? ...for which the plaintiff lays her damages at £1,500, we beg to inform you that a writ has been issued against you in this suit in the Court of Common Pleas uh, and request to know by return of post the name of your attorney in London who will accept service uh, thereof. Uh, we are, sir, your obedient servants... Dodson and Fogg. Uh, Dodson and Fogg, eh? Mm. Bardell against Pickwick. Disturbing I... the peace of mind and happiness of innocent females? It's a conspiracy. A base conspiracy between these two grasping attorneys, Dodson and Fogg, to extort money. B Mrs Bartell would never do it. She hasn't the heart to do it. She hasn't the case to do it. Who ever heard me address her in any way but that in which a lodger would address the, his landlady? Who ever saw oh, me with her? Except on one occasion. Oh, yes. One occasion. What occasion was that? Well, well, I, I don't know how it happened, mind, but, but she, but, uh, Mrs. Bardell, was certainly reclining in his arms. And our friend was soothing her anguish. So I was. <laughs> Well, I won't deny it. So I was. I recall the occasion now. Wiggle Tuppen, I beg your pardon for the observations I made just oh. now. We are all mm. the victims of circumstances, and I the greatest. I, I'll have it all explained, though. I'll see this. Dodson and Fogg, I'll go to London tomorrow. No, no, not tomorrow. No, not no, today. Well, then, the next day. The next day is the 1st of September, and you're going out shooting with us. Then the day after, Sam, um, take two places for London on Thursday for yourself and me. Very good, sir. And a right away, if you please. On my way, sir. <laughs> Rum fell of the Emperor. Think of his making up to that here, Mrs. Bardell, with a little boy, too. Always the way with these here old uns as he's such steady goers to look at. I didn't think he'd have done it, no. I didn't think he'd have done it. 
The birds, who happily for their own peace of mind and personal comfort were in blissful ignorance of the preparations which he'd been making to astonish them on the 1st of September, hailed it, no doubt, as one of the pleasantest mornings they had seen that season. Many a young partridge who strutted complacently among the stubble with all the finicking coxcombry of youth, and many an older one who watched his levity out of his little round eye with the contemptuous air of a bird of wisdom and experience, alike unconscious of their approaching doom, basked in the fresh morning air with lively and blithesome feelings, and a few hours afterwards were laid low upon the earth. But we grow affecting. Let us proceed. Morning, master. Uh, Morning, sir. Uh, All ready for you. Out you come, my friend. Uh, Sam, help uh, your master down. Uh, uh, Sir Jeffrey Manning's uh, keeper uh, and the boys uh, to carry uh, the game bags. Uh, Hi, Juno, uh, lass. Down, uh, Daph. Uh, hey, <laughs> Winkle, Tupman, you've forgotten your gun. Uh, so we have our... Uh, uh, my friends yes. aren't much in the way of this sort of thing yet, Martin. Oh. They'll be good shots one of these days. Uh, oh, I beg my friend Winkle's pardon, though. He's had some practice. <laughs> <laughs> I suggest you don't handle his piece the way he's a doing of at this moment, sir. Or you'll make cold meat to some of us. Uh, keep the gun up, sir. Ah! Oh, Sam, 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 did I hit you with a barrel? I, I'm very well, sorry. Well, sir, you... if you come to it this way, you'll fill one of them bags and something to spare at one fire. Sam, keep to the rear of us. That I will, sir, don't worry. Uh, where did you tell the boy to meet us with the lunch, Martin? Uh, side of one tree hill at twelve o'clock, sir. Oh, now uh, that's not Sir Geoffrey's land, is it? No, sir. Captain Baldwig's. There'll be nobody to interrupt us. There's a fine piece of turf there. Yeah, I hope you're right. Uh, Baldwig's a, a rum fellow, thinks he's somebody just because his wife's sister married a marquis. <laughs> yes. Are you all uh, join us at twelve, be quick? Certainly. Oh, ain't the gentleman a shot, sir? No, and he's lame besides. But I oh, should yeah. very much like to go, but I fear I can't manage the distance. Sir? Uh, well, boy? There's a wheelbarrow here, sir, by the edge. The gentleman's servant could wheel it along the path. The weary oh. thing! Well shade, small cheek! Here, uh, here, here, here you are, Governor. Oh, Here's the chariot. Oh. In you <laughs> get to make uh, yourself comfortable. Oh, Ah, ah, I hope I won't be too heavy for you, Sam. Not a bit of it, sir. There'll be plenty of rests. Hold tight now. We're oh. a-moving. Yeah. Hey. Sam, stop! Water! What's the matter? I won't suffer this barrow to be moved another step unless Winkle carries his gun in a different manner. How am I to carry it? Carry it with the muzzle to the ground. Oh, it's so unsportsmanlike. I don't care whether it's unsportsmanlike or not. I am not going to be shot in a wheelbarrow for the sake of appearances to please anybody. Oh, well, if you insist. Oh, can we get on now? Wait. Why are we stopping? Shh. What's the matter with the dog's legs? How queer they're standing. Shh. Don't you see they're making a point? What are they pointing at? Keep your eyes open. Now then. Well, where are they? Where are the birds? Tell me when to fire. Where are they? Where are they? Why, here, of course. See that fine brace of partridges Staff and Juno are bringing up? Well done, my lefties. No, no, I mean the others. They're far enough off by this time. Put them in the bag, boy. Uh, we'll be up with another covey in five minutes, so if the gentleman begins to fire now, perhaps he'll get the shot out of his barrel by the time they rise. <laughs> Sam. Sir. Don't laugh. Certainly not, sir. Now, Winkle. Follow me softly and don't be too late this time. <laughs> and never fear. Are they pointing? Not yet. Quietly now, quietly. Oh, oh sh dear. Sh oh, Winkle, what on earth did you do that for? The dogs weren't pointing. I never saw such a gun in my life. It goes off of its own accord. It will do it. Will do it? I wish you would hit something of his own accord. Uh, do that for long, sir. What do you mean by that observation, never sir? Never mind, sir, never mind. I've no family myself, and this boy's mother will get something handsome from Sir Geoffrey if he's killed on his land. So load again, sir, load again. No, no, take away his gun. Take oh, away yeah. his gun. Do you hear somebody? No, no, Pickwick, let him be. He'll do better later. Mm. Now, ah, now walk ahead with me, Winkle. Uh, Martin, you and the boy keep well to the side, understand? Yes, sir, and a bit to the rear as well. Now! Oh! oh, oh, oh good, 
Congratulations. Someone, my congratulations. You singled out that particular bird. Oh, no, 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 I merely... Oh, you did. I saw you do it. You picked him out. I noticed it as you raised your gun to take aim. You are an older hand of this game than I thought you. Bravo, bravo. Oh, no. <laughs> oh uh, well done, Tupman. It was in vain for Mr Tupman to protest that all he had done was to shut his eyes firmly and fire into the air. His very smile of self-denial was taken as evidence to the contrary. And from that time forth, his reputation was established. Meanwhile, Mr Winkle blazed and smoked and flashed away, sometimes expending his charge in mid-air, and at others sending it so near the surface of the ground as to place the lives of the two dogs on a rather uncertain and precarious tenure. As a display of fancy shooting, it was extremely varied and curious. As an exhibition of firing with any precise object, it was, on the whole, perhaps a failure. Well, there's one uh, bag full. We'll fill the other after lunch. Uh, uh, Pickwick? Uh, yes. You see that green hill over there? Uh, now, that's the place where we're to lunch. And... And by Jove, there's the boy with the basket now, punctual as clockwork. I must say I'm ready for lunch. Uh, wheel away, sir. At the double shirt. Uh, uh, out of the way, oh. young lovers. Uh, oh, oh. If you value uh, my precious life, don't upset uh, me, uh, as the gentleman said to the driver, but it was carrying uh, into Tyburn. Oh, uh, Near the top, sir. Hold on, hold on. It's a trifle oh, bumpy. Oh, uh, 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 here we are, sir. Uh, uh, don't tip Up me out. Sir Daisy. Oh. Oh. oh, nice and soft to fall on, sir. <laughs> now you sit there, sir, while I help shove back the basket. Oh. Lay the cloth, young'un, and leave the victuals to your betters. Ah, oh. wheel pie. Ooh. Very good thing is wheel pie, yeah. when you know the lady has made it and is quite sure it ain't kittens. Yeah. And Arthur all wears the odds. When they're so like wheel, the worry pie and themselves don't know the difference. Do it this, sir. Oh, not they, sir. I lodged in the same house with a pieman once, sir, and a very nice man he was. Regular clever chap, too. Make pies out of anything he could. What a number of cats you keep, Mr Brooks, says I. When I got intimate with him, oh, says he, I do, a good many, says he. You must be very fond of cats, says I. Other people is, says he, a-vinking at me. They ain't in season till the vinter, though, says he. Not in season, says I. No, says he. Fruits is in, cats is out. Fruits. Why, what do you mean, says I? Mean, says he? That I'll never be a party to the combination of butchers to keep up the prizes of meat, says he. <laughs> Mr Weller, says he, a squeeze in my hand very hard and whispering in my ear. Don't mention this ear again, but it's the seasoning as does it. Me. They're all made of them noble animals, says he, appointing to a very nice little tabby kitten, and oh. I seasons them for beefsteak, wheel or kidney, according to the demand. And more than that, says he, I can make a wheel, a beefsteak or a beefsteak and kidney or any one of them and a mutton at a minute's notice, just as the market changes and appetite's weary. He must have been a really ingenious young man, that, sir. Um, just was, sir. And the pies was beautiful. Oh, oh tongue. Well, oh, that's a very good thing when it ain't a woman's. Bread, knuckle of ham. Regular picture. Mm. Cold beef in slices. What's in them stone jars, young livers? Beer in this one. Gold punch in t'other. And a very good notion of a lunch it is, mm. take it all together. <coughs> all unpacked, gentlemen, fall on. As the English said to the French when they fixed bayonets. Well, <laughs> smoking day, isn't it? It oh. is indeed, even to me. I don't know how you must have felt it. Oh, pretty hot, but a glass of punch will soon set that to rights. Aye. Pour the punch, boy. Pick me a glass with you. With great pleasure. <laughs> ah. Mm. Oh, really, it's 
quite excellent. I tell you what I shall do to get my shooting up again. I'll put a stuffed partridge on the top of a post and practice at it, beginning at a short distance and lengthening it by degrees. <laughs> I understand it's capital practice. I know a gentleman, sir, who's that and begun at two yards and he never tried it again for he blowed the bird clean away at the first fire and nobody ever seen a feather on him afterwards. Sam. Oh, yeah. Sir. I have the goodness to reserve your anecdotes until they are called for. Certainly, sir. How Snodgrass would have enjoyed this, if yes. not the shooting. Yes. <laughs> Our absent friend. Let us drink his health. Snodgrass. Ah, oh, Snodgrass. Oh, dear me. A thought has just occurred to me. Oh. I have a notion there may be orange peel in this punch, and orange peel always disagrees with me. Uh, fill my glass again, Sam, so I can make sure. Uh, how's that, sir? Oh, I, I fancy there's none in it. Oh. Ah, yes, you're quite right. <laughs> I may drink it safely here. There is a song which I knew in my infancy, about the joys of the countryside. Good fellowship. I wish I could recall it. Uh, did you begin to fill the flowing bowl? Uh, a toast to our good friend and host of Dongley Dill. Dingley Dell. Oh, that's, that is what I said. Sam, um, I, I have spilled my punch. Kindly replenish my glass. Thank you. To our, to our dear friend and host of Dingley Dell, our kind Mr. Mr. Wardle. I was about to say, Wardle Winkle, now you've fooled me out. <laughs> Let us raise our glasses to. to uh, hey, uh, hey, hey, watch out, sir. Watch out. Uh, it was my intention to sit down, Sam. In fact, I intend to lie down. Uh, good night, my friend. Friends. I bless you all. It ain't bedtime, sir. Hey, wake up! He don't stir, sir. And I don't reckon he will, neither, for a couple of hours. Yeah, well, we'll, uh, we'll leave him here, then. We'll be no more than an hour, anyway. Pack up the things and follow us, Sam. Ready, Tupman, Winkle? Ready when you are, Mr Wardle. Good. Right Come on, on then. <laughs> Hunt. Yes, a cotton ball wag. Remind me to have a board done about trespassers and spring guns and all that sort of thing. Keep the common people out. Do you hear, Hunt? Do you hear? I'll not forget, sir. Ah, I'll see you down. Only, uh, begging your pardon, sir. Well, what, man? What? I think there have been trespassers here today, sir. What? I confound their audacity, so they have. They've actually been devouring their food here. Yes, sir. I wish I had the vagabonds here. Uh, beg pardon, sir, but over there, in the wheelbarrow. Oh. Confound it. It's one of them having the impudence to go to sleep on my land. Yes, sir. Who are you, you rascal? Hey. Hey, 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 hey. What's the hey. matter with him, Hunt? He don't even wake up when he's potted. Oh, no, sir. What's your name, you villain? Yes, um, Cold Punch. Well, what? Sir. What did he say his name was? Punch, I think, sir. Oh, that's his impudence, sir. He's only feigning to be asleep now. Cold He's punch. a drunken plebeian. Oh. We'll wheel him away directly, Hunt. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Where to, sir? I'll, 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 I'll wheel him to the devil. Oh, I'll, yes, sir. Uh, no, stay. Wheel him to the animal pound. Hunt. Let's see whether he calls himself Punch when he comes round. He shan't bully me, Hunt. Wheel him away. <laughs> Boy, another one, Jim. 
Give him a turnip on the nozzle. What? What? I want to get you out, fat. I didn't see it, but I'm. What have you said? Now he is sad. Top of the hill. Help me keep the crowd back while he gets out. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. Come on, Come on, sir. Can you get your leg over the painting? Just about it. Keep him uh, back with the water uh, while I get him uh, in the carriage. Uh, in you get, sir. Uh, oh, 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 oh. All right, gentlemen. He's safe. Scramble on. Drive on, man, quickly. Oh, <sighs> oh. Uh, all right, sir. We're leaving him behind. You're safe now. How on earth did I get in there? We were trespassing, it mm. seems, and Captain Boldwing had you wheeled off his lap. But he didn't it in. But I, I bring an action against him directly I get to London. No, no, you won't. Indeed, I will. Why not? Because, my dear fellow, you've won action on your hands already. Bardell against Pickwick is quite enough without Boldwing against Pickwick. Besides, if you did, they might turn round on some of us and say we had taken too much cold punch. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> This seems to be the place, sir. Dodson and Fogg, yes. attorneys at law. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, knock, if you please, Sam. It says coming. Can't you read? Nice manners, sir. Uh... Oh, what do you want? Speak up quick, we're busy. I have come especially to see either Mr Dodson or Mr Fogg, sir. My name is Pickwick. Oh, well, then you can go in. Follow me. Uh, Mr. Fogg said if you should call, you were to be seen immediate. <laughs> Mr. Pickwick, sir. Ah, Mr. Pickwick, uh, come in. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Fogg, and this is Mr. Dodson. Uh, please. Uh, uh, you are the defendant, uh, sir, in Bardell and Pickwick? I am, sir. Well, sir, and what do you propose? Quite. What do you propose, Mr. Pickwick? I came here, gentlemen, to express the surprise with which I received your letter the other day, and to inquire what grounds of action you can have against me. Grounds? Mr. Of... Fogg. I am going to speak to you. I beg your pardon, Mr. Dodson. Uh, for the grounds of action, Mr. Pickwick, we are guided entirely by the statement of our client. Quite. Mrs. Bardell actually asserts that I made her a proposal of marriage. She does, sir. And I do not hesitate to say, sir, that our grounds of action are strong <laughs> and not to be shaken. Well, no. I am to understand, then, that it is really your intention to proceed with this action. That you certainly may, sir. And, and the damages are actually laid at fifteen hundred pounds. To which understanding you may add our assurance that if we could have prevailed upon our client, they would have been laid at treble the amount, sir. Unquestionably, Mr. Dodson. Very well, gentlemen. Very well. You shall hear from my solicitor, gentlemen. Oh, we shall be very happy to do so. And before I go, gentlemen, permit me to say that of all the disgraceful and rascally proceedings... Stay, sir, stay, stay. Allow me to open the door. Mr. Jackson, Mr. Wicks... I want you to hear what this gentleman says. <laughs> Pray go on, sir. Disgraceful and rascally proceedings, I think you say. But I did. And if you wish, I will repeat it, sir. You hear that, Mr. Wicks? You won't forget those expressions, Mr. Jackson. Uh, perhaps you would like to call us swindlers, sir. <laughs> Pray do so if you feel disposed. But I do. You are swindlers. Very good. You can hear it in there, I hope, Mr. Wicks. Oh, yes, sir. Well, go on, sir. Do go on. You had better call us thieves, sir. Or perhaps you would like to assault one of us. Pray do it, sir, if you would like. We will not make the smallest yeah, resistance, sir. What's going Pray on? Out of my way. Here, 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 here. You just... No, sir. No, sir. Come sir. away. Get no, sir. No, 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 you I don't, wish sir. Christmas, my... You've done battle, door and 
shuttlecocks are very good right. game when okay. you ain't the shuttlecock and two lawyers the battle for. In which case it gets too exciting to be pleasant. Come you. away, sir. Please. If you want to it's ease right. your mind by blowing somebody up, come in the courtyard no. and blow me up. It's rather too expensive work to be carried on here. I have never... Brandy and water. Warm, sir. Um, Very good thing for ruffled feelings, that, sir. Uh, thank you, Sam. Sam. Sir. Uh, that stout gentleman in the corner with the shawls and the pipe. He appears to be taking a very great deal of interest in us. Well, blessed if I can tell for all this smoke he's a-making. Never seen such a regular chimney. He's, he's coming over. Um, Why, Sammy! <laughs> Tis Samuel, aren't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wouldn't have believed it. Ah. It's the old un. How are you, my ancient? Why, Sammy, I haven't seen you for two years and better. No more you have, old codger. How's mother-in-law? Oh, why, I tell you what, Sammy, there never was a nicer woman as a widow than that here second winter of mine. All I can say on her now is it's a great pity she ever changed her condition. <laughs> she don't act as a wife, Sammy. Don't she, don't. Now, take example by your father, my boy, and be very careful of widows all your life. <laughs> ah, begging your pardon, sir. I hope you haven't got a widow, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Not I, Mr. Weller. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Mr. Pickwick, father, oh. as I serve you now. I hope you got no fault to find with Sammy, sir. Uh, none. Whatever. Ah, I took a great deal of pains with his education, sir. Let him run the streets when he was very young and shift for himself. It's the only way to make a boy sharp, sir. Mm. And not a very sure one, neither. Mm. I got regular done the other day. No. I did, by a canting, Methodist sort of chap in Mulberries that vept all the time he was having me ah. on. Then I meet him and his precious no, master oh, again. Hold a minute, Sammy. Had a master, did he? Said he was. I reckon they was hand in glove together. Now, would this here master chap be tall and slim with long hair mm. and the gift of the gab were he galloping? Yeah. That's right. And the tubber, a tubber, a black haired chap in mulberry livery with a very large head. <laughs> Have you seen them, Mr. Weller? <laughs> I know where they are this wedding minute. I drove them to Hipswich day afore yesterday. No. Facts are. You're quite certain it was them, Governor? Quite, Sammy, quite. But their appearance is very singular. And more than that, as they sat in front, right behind the box, I heard them laughing and saying how they done old fireworks. Oh, oh. old fireworks, sir. Oh. <laughs> By oh. which I've no doubt they meant you, sir. <laughs> I'll, I'll follow them immediately. Well, I shall work down to Hipswich Day after tomorrow, sir. So if you really mean to go, you better go with me. I, I write to my friends at Berry and tell them to meet me there. Um, thank you, Mr. Weller. Oh, good day to you, sir. And you, Sammy Ball. I'll see you on the Hipswich coach. Bye, Governor. Oh, now, we better be getting on our way, sir. Which way is it? Agrees in, Sam. Uh, Mr. Perker's offices. Top floor, is it, sir? Uh, Looks all closed up. We well, are certainly later than I intended to be. Knock, knock, uh, will you, Sam? Hey. Oh. oh, no answer, sir. I reckon I've all retired from business for the night. Oh, this is very unfortunate. I know I shan't get one wink of sleep tonight unless I get the satisfaction of reflecting that I have confided this matter to a professional man. Is, is an old woman coming up the stairs, so perhaps she'll know where we can find somebody. Hello, old lady, where's Mr Perker's people? Mr Perker's people's gone, and I'm a going to do the horses out. <laughs> Are you uh, Mr Perker's servant? I'm Mr Perker's laundress. Yes. It's a curious circumstance, Sam, that they call the old women in these inns laundresses. I wonder what that's for. Because they has a mortal aversion to washing anything, I suppose, sir. I shouldn't wonder. Do you know where I can find Mr Perker, my good woman? Uh, no, I don't. He's out of town now. Oh, that is unfortunate. Where's his clerk? Do you know? Yes, I know where he is. 
But he won't thank me for telling you. I have very particular business with him. Oh, there's no point in your meeting him now. Hey, he's a great one for the brandy and water, is young Mr. Loughton. I see. Uh, won't it do in the morning? No, it won't. Tomorrow morning I set off for Ipswich on business that won't wait. Then your business with Mr. Perkham will have to wait, won't it? Oh, dear me, sir. What is to be done? The only thing to do is leave Mr. Perker a note telling him where we shall be. Do you think you could conveniently manage that, old lady? Maybe. <laughs> and with that, Mr. Pickwick had to be content. It was time now to seek out Jingle and exact revenge for all the wrongs that he had sustained at his hand. The appellation Old Fireworks, though not positively vile or atrocious, had been the feather which had turned the scale. In part three of Charles Dickens's The Pickwick Papers, dramatised by Barry Campbell and Constance Cox, the part of Mr Pickwick was played by Freddie Jones, Mrs Bardell, Elizabeth Spriggs, Sam Weller, Douglas Livingstone, Mr Snodgrass, Stephen Thorne, Mr Winkle, Philip Bond, Mr. Tupman, Michael Graham Cox. Mr. Wardle, Jack May. Job Trotter, Tim Wilton. Tony Weller, John Hollis. Dodson and Fogg, John Gabriel and Michael Tudor Barnes. And Charles Dickens by Simon Cadell. With Heather Bell, Elizabeth Bell, William Edel, Michael Goldie, Brenda Kay, Jane Knowles, Joan Matheson, Tom Owen, Mary Elliot Nelson, Kenneth Shanley, Gladys Spencer, and Peter Wickham. The director was Jane Morgan.